Welcome to this session uh, where we're going to cover Chris Watts, who is in prison currently for murdering his pregnant wife and his two children. And uh, we've chosen this video for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, it's, uh, it's high stakes. Uh, this is um, significant. It's, it's a murder case. And the consequences for Chris Watts being caught as the perpetrator are significant. So this is a good example to show how behaviour can leak when people are trying to hide a crime such as this. The second reason we've chosen this clip is to highlight the importance of baseline. And this is often misunderstood. And I'll tell you more about that later on. If you want to know more about the case, then you can check uh, lower down in the description. And that will give you the background to the case if you want to know more. So we're going to be using the SCAN system, the six channel analysis system. And that's used to analyze the behavior of individuals. If you've not seen that model before, you might want to follow the link that follows up here, which will take you through an introduction to that system. So what we've done for you here is pull together a mixture of clips from the various media and police interviews to show you how we apply the SCAN system and give you an insight to the case. So let's move into the first clip. And this is a clip from inside his house where the police are talking to him fairly informally about what's gone on. Um, because the claim is, is that he went to work and his wife took the children out of the home that morning and has never come back and she's missing. So that's his narrative, that's his story. And the police here are trying to work out what's going, what's going on. Let's just watch his behavior as he explains this to the police. <coughs> She was still here when I left. You went to a job site or? So what he's saying here is she was here when I left. So I left for work very early this morning, 5.15 this morning, and she was here when I left. And he's keen to make that point quite clear uh, because if he can say she was here when I left, I went to work, then I came back and we, she was gone, he disconnects himself from her disappearance. However, when he's making that claim, let's look closely at his body language. She was still here when I left. She was still here when I left. So he's made an affirmative statement, but we've got three contradictions in his behavior that tell us that there's a problem with that claim. Uh, number one, if you look down at his hands, you get this double-sided hand shrug. So down on the bottom left of the screen, you'll see his hands rotating out like this. It's very small and it's out of the communication zone. He's not trying to send a signal to the police officers. He's doing this uh, out of that presentation zone. So this is leakage. So he's leaking information that he's not confident in the words he's using. So to its full extent, the double-sided hand shrug is part of the full gesture of I've no conviction to the words I'm using, uh, or I'm not sure, or I'm disconnected from what I'm saying. And that disconnect uh, is being done probably below consciousness. He may not be aware that he's leaking that partial gesture. We call that a gestural slip. So that's one indicator, but we never rely on one indicator. For us to have confidence that deception is at play, we need three indicators from the 27 in the scanner system that are across two channels. And by channels, you'll see from the reference we sent to you earlier, that this is either the face, the body, the psychophysiology, the voice, the way people are speaking, or the words they use. So across those six channels, if we see three indicators that corroborate across those channels within a seven second time frame, that's significant. So we've got one. But what you'll see while he's doing that hand shrug on the bottom left, is you'll notice his eyes are closed. This is not a blink. His eyes are closed for five frames. Now, on a 25 frame rate, 25 frames per second, that's one fifth of a second. So that classifies as an eye closure. And research tells us this blocking gesture with the eyes is he's distancing himself from the words he's using by putting a barrier between himself and the words he's just, he's just laid out in front of him. So we've got the hand shrug and we've got the eye closure. Two significant indicators, but that's not enough. We need a cluster of three. So if we listen to the voice, we get a third indicator. Let's just have a listen. 
but she was still here when I left. She was still here when I left. Now, the volume drops about 50%. So when you hear a volume drop that's significant like this, 50% of the volume, then there's usually three hypotheses on that. Number one, uh, they're sad. And we're not seeing any other reinforcing signals of sadness here. Um, so that's doubtful. Number two is that they're unsure. Well, he's, he's not unsure. He's making a clear statement to try and say, she was here when I left. So the third is deception. So when people are being deceptive, they can distance them, uh, themselves from the words by dropping the volume. We know lies are bad. Uh, our parents and teachers tell us lies are bad. So when we tell them, we get this subconscious leakage in volume drop that can give us a clue that deception is at play. Again, it's only one indicator. But now we have something from the voice and the body, and there's three indicators, the volume drop, the double-sided micro gesture, and we've got the eye blocking. So three indicators give us an indication that there's something wrong here. We should check and verify his claim that she was at the house when he left for work. So let's watch that again, and then we'll play the video on. But she was still here when I left. You went to a job site or you went to the main plant or where'd you go? I went to location first. Where was that? By, by Hudson. Over there, east of Hudson. And there was someone there at the time when you got there? No, no. Uh, one of the operators, he had an issue there on Friday, about to run over the weekend. I went over there just to kind of verify what kind of issue with you with you was having, see if I could fix it. So we've got some more leakage going on here. Um, so as we're watching the video, you'll have seen uh, the hand shrugs again, and maybe you also spotted a little micro head shake no. When he was saying, I went over there to verify what the issue was to see if I could uh, fix it. So in other words, he's trying to uh, convince us that he went to work with a purpose. Uh, but that convincing tactic is coming through and clashing with his behavior. So what we see here, if I just wind this back a little bit, is a micro head shake no. One of what's his uh, behavioral tics, uh, and again baseline, is he does a lot of this. He'll move his head backwards and forwards, about two centimeters from center. And that's just the way he speaks when he's talking on camera. So we've got to be careful with those gestures. Again, that seems to be part of his baseline when he's being interviewed in the media interviews and police interviews. So be careful not to misjudge this. Because some people say, if he's saying something affirmative and he's going like this, he's negating it, he's leaking um, a no response. Be very careful. Macro head shakes, uh, we pay no heed to. But if it's micro, we're talking less than a centimeter either way on the tip of the nose. If it's a micro head shake or head nod, then often we find that that's below consciousness and it's probably part of leakage. And that seems to be what we've got here. So if you watch the tip of his nose, you see a little micro head shake left and right, just at this point. And let's listen to what he's saying at that point. What can I do with you with you with having to see if I can fix it? So I was going to see if I could fix it. So he's, he's, it seems like he's invented this problem he's going to fix because his behavior suggesting that problem doesn't exist. Now, the head shake on its own is one indicator. So uh, what else is going on? Well, if you look again at the uh, bottom of the screen, you'll see his, his hands are rotating outwards again. It's, it's a bit grainy, but you'll see hand in, hand out, hand in, hand out. So he's doing the same gestural slip of having no confidence in the words I'm using, but it's almost out of camera shot. So you, when you're looking at videos like this, you need to uh, step back and make sure you're taking in the, the whole of the body. And here we can just catch it on the bottom of the, uh, the body cam that the police are using. So we've got the head shake, no, which is micro, negating his claim that he went to work to fix something. We've got the double-handed shrug from the hands again. We've also got a volume drop. Let's have a listen. I went over there just to kind of verify what kind of issue with you with you with having, see if I can fix it. 
So he's come round from uh, probably about a six on his volume scale to about a three. Not as big as last time, but it's still a volume drop. So he's pulling himself away from the statement that I went over to work to fix some issue. And then as soon as he's finished his statement, uh, this is why I suggested before it was a convinced statement, after his head shake, no, he then moves into three head nods, yes. Trying to drive it home, please believe me. Well, if you're telling the truth, you don't need to convince people. You just tell the truth. But if the facts aren't your friend, sometimes you need to employ a tactic of convince. And so this makes a fourth indicator. Let's just watch that move to a head nod at the end. So I'll just scroll back a little bit. And you'll see here four or five little head nod yeses. And the words are finished, so it's out of sync. He's not saying, see if I could fix it. It's see if I could fix it. And then, you know, please believe that. And he's trying to push it. Um, they'll protest too much. You know, you, you, you're trying too hard here. So that fits the cluster of four indicators across multiple channels to suggest this is a hot spot too. So this is something that needs probing. Did he leave his wife in the home? Did he go to work to fix a problem? And what we've highlighted is two problem areas or red flags that the police would need to investigate. So let's move from this video onto a second scenario. So what I'd like you to do is just pay attention here and then we'll work through it together of what's going on. This might be a tough question, but did, did you guys get into an argument before the shooting? It wasn't, it wasn't like an argument. We had an emotional conversation, but I'll leave it at that. But So the news interviewer is suggesting that um, I heard you had some form of uh, argument. Uh, so they're interested in delving a little bit on this case. Now, what you'll notice is um, we've got a swaying. Let me just scroll back slowly. You've got this swaying from him. We've seen this before. Uh, so the swaying, I'm ignoring that, and I'm classifying that as baseline. So that's baseline anxiety, which may not be something to do with deception. Could be, but may not be, because he's under pressure of a, a media interview. There's a camera in his face. There'll be a microphone. There'll be two or three people at least um, watching him answer these questions. So the, uh, the little shift in here, uh, be, be careful not to over-credit that in terms of a deception indicator. It seems to be his way of coping with anxious situations like this. But he's clamping his arms, and that's interesting. Um, that could be to do with the anxiety of the media interview, um, but we didn't see that inside the house. So often people will clamp their arms because they're uncomfortable or because they're cold. Um, but you'll see the muscles uh, on his arms. He's actually tensing the muscles here. And some people think, I don't want to leak my body language, especially if I'm being deceptive. So one way of controlling my body is to tense it up. And some people use this as a tactic to avoid giving things away. The problem is, researchers told us that that kind of body tension, depending on the story and the context, uh, can be an indicator of deception. So right now, I'm going, to, I'm going to hold that tension as a potential indicator of deception. What popped out to me as well as I was scrolling back and forwards on his, on his answer here about, uh, well, no, we didn't really have an argument. Um, and it was just an emotional discussion. You'll see that there's a little shoulder shrug there. It's from both shoulders, and it's only one centimeter. But you may have noticed it earlier now we've told you about this. So we've got this double-sided shoulder shrug. So it's not the hand shrug. The hands can't move because he's got them clamped up. But So it's leaking out. It's popping out of the shoulders. So the full extent, remember, is I've no confidence in the words I'm using. I'm detached from this statement. Is a double-sided shoulder shrug up and hands outwards. So before we saw the leakage from the hands, now we've got it from the shoulders. Sometimes we see it from just one shoulder. But here, We've got one centimetre movement when he's, um, he's saying that um, it, it wasn't like an argument, we just had an emotional conversation. Let's just play it again. This might be a tough question, but did, did, did you guys get into an argument before the shooting? It wasn't, it wasn't like an argument. We had an emotional conversation, but I'll leave it at that. But 
But there's also something else going on. If you look at his top lip, when he's talking about the conversation he had, we get this indication, a flash of a micro expression. Let me zoom in. Of contempt. So the, the, the lip, if you watch his left lip corner, it moves up towards the center of his cheek. So this is only one frame. Um, so it, it lasts for probably three frames, but the, the movement can be seen just on this one frame of it moving up towards the center of his left cheek. Now that movement can really only be activated by the buccinator muscle in the center of the cheek. The buccinator pulls that lip up, which is a reliable indicator of contempt. So there's also emotion going on here. Is he feeling contempt towards the focus and the subject of his story, which is his wife? So is he putting himself above his wife here and looking down and describing her behavior in a derogatory sense? Uh, or is he being contemptuous towards the interviewer because the interviewer is probing about this emotional discussion? He could be either. So we've got a cluster of four indicators. Some we leave question marks uh, around here uh, because we'd have to check uh, what, what happens and whether this is corroborated later on. But this, um, was it an emotional discussion or was the more at play there? Uh, from this clip, uh, we've got doubts about his claim that it was just an emotional conversation. Let's watch that combined at full speed. It wasn't, it wasn't like an argument. We had an emotional conversation, but I'll... And he wants to get off this subject. So you watch that cluster again of the shoulders, the head shake, the volume down, and the contempt uh, from the left lip. Uh, but he wants to brush this away. Listen how he wraps this, this up. It wasn't, it wasn't like an argument. We had an emotional conversation, but I'll leave it at that. But it's... I just want them back. <laughs> so I want to leave it at that. Um, but then he tries to uh, move the subject into, I just want them back. Uh, so that sounds okay. Not really. What's going on when he says, uh, I just want them back? He's broke free from the tension on the arms, and we've got this rotation outwards of his left arm. So a single-sided hand shrug when he's claiming he just wants them back. We've also got the eyes closed at this point, which reinforces the negation of, I just want them back. Uh, and why is that not um, a true statement? Uh, because you would hypothesize here that he either doesn't want them back uh, or he knows they will never come back. So eyes closed, hand shrug. That head shake's a bit big, we're going to ignore that. But look at his smile on his face. Let's zoom in. This is highly inappropriate. It's, it's inappropriate emotions for, I just want them back. And this is probably one of two things going on. He's either happy that he's, he thinks he's getting away with his story. And the smile is, I mean, it puts so much pressure on his face that he has to break it and uh, give us a little bit of a laugh. Even though that's inappropriate, and if he was watching this back, he's probably kicking himself, but he's displaying an emotion which doesn't fit with the claim that his children and his wife are missing and he wants them back. He's not appealing to any perpetrators. He's not angry as her for taking the kids. Uh, he seems to be happy. So a cluster of four indicators when he's saying, I just want them back. Let's move on to another clip. We're now in a uh, interview room with a police officer. And uh, this is one day after his wife went missing. About uh, 4.15, that's when I get back, slide right into bed next to her and start having a conversation with her about having the house, the house left for sale and talking about it, except like actually going, proceeding with the separation. Okay. And obviously it gets pretty emotional. Like we're talking about, you know, like we felt this, the disconnection was there, like falling out of love and trying to stay together, maybe just for the kids' sake, but we're realizing that doing like our homework, it's not, most of the time that's not gonna work. Yeah. And it gets pretty emotional because we have two beautiful kids and we have one on the way. So it's just a matter of like, it was very emotional, we were both crying. And at the end, we just said, you know, 
she said she was going to take the kids to her friend's house for the day. She would be back. Okay. And so I went downstairs, made my protein shake. Uh, the 5 a.m. That's when I did that. Okay. Packed my lunchbox, had my oatmeal, chicken, filled my water jug up. 5:15, I went outside, backed my truck up with loaded. So I've let that run uh, because we can hear two parts to a story. And uh, if we're listening to the story, okay, we, we saw some hand shrugs outwards. You may have, he's moved from his hand clamping when he's describing. We had some emotional conversations and it breaking up is difficult. And um, some of that conversation he seemed to be get, getting engaged with. So he was using illustrators. He was emphasizing some points with his left hand. So maybe that was true. Um, maybe he's, he's saying, uh, you know, we, we had a difficult relationship. Maybe his tactic is to not be an angel here and say, yeah, we had difficulties, but I didn't kill her. But when we're um, watching an individual, we're also listening. And what we will often do, if we've got time, uh, and uh, with videos you have time to do this, is we'll take a transcript uh, of the words being used. Some people, some of our clients send us a transcript. We are very careful not to take that transcript and use it. What we do is our own transcript and we verify it. The reason is, if you're trying to do some analysis of the words being used, you need to get the exact words that are used. And transcribers sometimes make mistakes and we don't want to misjudge a person on the words they've used because of a transcription error. So what we've done is uh, taken a paragraph of what he's just said and I'll uh, just lay that out here of how he's just finished. So we were both crying uh, and at the end, at the end is interesting, you know, at the end of what? Uh, so maybe that's a verbal slip, but let's put that aside. But we were both crying and he's just finished this a conversation about we've had some well not a fallout but we had some emotional discussions about the impact and how we feel about separating and she said she was going to take the kids to a friend's house for the day this is the story he's trying to get us to believe that she left, left the house and took the kids uh, to get some space and uh, uh, whether she was coming back or going to her friends to create distance we don't know but his argument is she went to the friend's house for the day uh, and she would be back. And I was like, okay, that's fine. And then uh, ignore the asterisks. If you just read the rest of the words here, went downstairs, made my protein shake. These, this is what he said. Um, 5 a.m., uh, that's when I did that. Packed my lunchbox, some oatmeal, chicken, filled my water jug up, uh, went outside, backed my truck up, loaded up. Uh, what do you think should be in place of the asterisks? Personal pronouns like I and my and me. Uh, we've had some good research from uh, Penny Baker who looked at the difference between truthful accounts and deceptive accounts. And what he and others have found is that when people tell lies, they disconnect themselves from the words by omitting the personal pronouns like I, me and my. And that's exactly what we've got here. He said, um, uh, why didn't you say I went downstairs, I made my protein shake, uh, I, I packed my lunch box, I filled my water jug. So we need to bear in mind, is this baseline? Some people speak like that all the time. You might be summarizing and speaking like bullet point style and just rattling these points off. So we need to be conscious of baseline and I'll show you how this continues in a second because we played the police interview through and he doesn't normally drop his pronouns, especially when it's things that can be verified, which is, uh, is coming next about uh, one of his friends who visited the house and so on. The eyes come back in. So this is a change in use of pronouns. So the absence of pronouns isn't the indicator. It's the change in the use of pronouns, which is an indicator. So he's dropped his connection to these words. And if you remember earlier, the eye closure and the dropping of the volume, those are two distancing tactics that people use subconsciously. Another one, and it's probably below consciousness this, because when you're speaking and you're thinking, it's very hard to construct your sentences in a way that's credible. And he's, he's, he's leaking deception here because he's missing those pronouns. And he's probably not aware of that. So that disconnection means, uh, went downstairs, made a protein shake, 
uh, is highly suspect, that, that narrative. And it kind of reminds us of what we call script memory. So if you want to create an alibi for uh, a time period that you want people to believe, a tactic that liars will use is they'll cherry pick what they normally do on a morning. And they'll replay that script, that record of, I get up, I turn the alarm clock off, I have breakfast, I get in the car, I go to work. In this case, what he seems to do, maybe, um, this is our suspicions, every morning, is he goes downstairs, making a protein shake, he packs his lunchbox, he oatmeal and chicken, high protein, ready for the gym maybe, filled my water jug up, went outside, back my truck up, load up, and that could be a routine operation that's so easy for him to use. Liars will often use the truth uh, to help them embed or disguise the lies. So is he using the truth from that morning? I don't think so, because we've got this, this cluster uh, of behavior and pronouns missing. Now, let me just play you what he says next, and you'll hear the eyes, eyes, eyes cropping back in when he's talking about something that can be corroborated as a truth. Just have a listen. 5.30, that's when I went to work. Okay. And I hadn't heard from Shanann for, to, for about two hours there, so the 7.40 I texted her and asked her if she could tell me where the kids were if she took them anywhere. Okay. Nothing. Okay. She, at 12, I texted her again, called me. Nothing. And then about 12, 10 p.m., that's when my doorbell visitor, it read another visitor, and I was like, hey, it popped up on my phone, and it says it was Nicole. And I try to put her on the, my phone to see if she, like she's just trying to get in or whatnot. And I hear like she's on the phone trying to. I could t I could hear her all through my phone saying she's trying to get this man. So that's when I called her. Yeah, I mm -hmm. called her at twelve twenty. See what was going on. She told me that Shannon hadn't responded to any of her calls all day. Or so what you'll have heard there is he's now describing something that is verifiable. The fact that uh, Nicole, uh, one of uh, Shannon's friends had visited the house, he'd seen it on the doorbell, and you hear the me, my, I heard, I heard. So all the personal pronouns have come back in. So this change or dropping of personal pronouns in the first component of this video makes that component highly suspect and is worthy of review. So we need to check the hypothesis. Let's revisit a component of the story, and sometimes we'll narrow this down. So we've just heard you speaking for an hour in the interview, and there's this little bit of five minutes here about when you woke up at four o'clock, went to work at five o'clock, where you've been leaking all these behaviours. Uh, so can you tell me in more detail precisely what happened from this point to this point is a, a good interview tactic. And that's what the officers use. So let's watch that. And he's going back to that segment where we've seen all the leakage. So you wake up at four, mm -hmm. from, at four, then what, until you start the conversation? Uh, Get dressed, get my, get my clothes on, brush my teeth, deodorant, all that kind of stuff. There we go. Uh, and uh, you've noticed it. There's no personal pronouns. So he's gone back into script. Uh, we've checked his baseline. He does use I, me's and my's in his normal narrative. But when we come back to what you did that morning, he's gone back to uh, brush my teeth, got the clothes on, and he's dropped out the personal pronoun. He's distanced himself from the activities what we can start to conclude here is that he's creating a narrative that he's not connected to. This next clip, the police officer takes a punt with uh, probably a risky question because he's starting to be accusatory, uh, but he's easing in nicely by saying, do you think she's having an affair? Let's watch the behavior of Watts while he's talking about uh, whether he thinks that Shanann is having an affair. That's just suspicion. Okay. Not one guy. Or girl. If, if, if that was the case, I mean, I didn't have one suspicion about it. Like, if, if, if it happened, it wasn't even like, I wasn't aware. Nothing there, was no aware. Clue. there was no, like, you know, texting with the phone, like, back or, like, you know, I walk in, swipe type yeah. thing. I, I didn't really have any of that. Okay. No perfume when she's going out with the girls. She always smells, she always sprays something you on know that. I mean, yeah, I know that. It wasn't, it wasn't like, you know, like that one in a million perfume or something like that, you know. Like, no late nights that surprised you. But, okay. Now let's talk about you. Okay. Okay. Um, on your end, I gotta ask, what's, what's your name? 
I don't have another one. You sure? I'm sure. Okay. Would you tell me if you did? Yes. Okay. Um, so, again, highly trained investigator over here, right? I see pictures of you from a few years ago, mm -hmm. and I see you standing before me now. Okay. 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 You've gotten pretty fit. Okay. You can imagine when guys start cheating or want to cheat, that's what happens. Yes. So tell me about it. I did not cheat on my wife. Okay, you're getting good at this now. Uh, I did not cheat on my wife and we get the drift volume drop. We get the single-sided hand shrug and uh, we've got the clamping and he's, he's fixed in this part of the interview. So we've, we've got a cluster and I did not cheat on my wife uh, is highly likely to be deceptive because of the scientific pins we've just seen clustered from multiple channels in a response to an unexpected question. So let's just watch the components of this last response talking about his wife having an affair and uh, are, are you, what's her name? That's a great question, an assumptive question of you're having an affair, I just want to know her name. So as soon as he moves into are you having an affair, that's the second half. Now just watch the illustrators, that's the hand movements during this session. So I'm scrolling backwards now to the beginning and I'm going quite fast with my fingers. You see the head nods on the police officer we we'll just look at the clamping down from what? Until I wind back to where he's talking about his wife having an affair. So here he's talking about his, uh, no, I'd know if she was and the phone calls and perfume and everything else. And he's reinforcing speech with illustrators. So that's where the body parts support the speech. And, um, uh, but as soon as we, and I'm going quite, quite fast here, as soon as we get to the surprise question about you, we get zero movement. So that kind of body tension shows us a spike in anxiety. Uh, and he doesn't want to leak anything. And if he was telling the truth, you would probably be offended at the question. Uh, you might be angry at the question. You might uh, say, uh, come on, uh, we're actually trying to find out where she is. She's, she's a missing person. Somebody's taken her or she's walking. Out. And, you know, let's, let's get back to the focus rather than concentrate on me. But no, we get this defensive reaction and this drop in illustrators. And we get the nice little wrap-up of the three signals at the end uh, when um, we get the denial. So the police officers are, are really on to something here. The suspicion and hypotheses which supported by behaviour is he didn't leave her at the home, he didn't go to work as normal to do work things, and uh, he is having an affair. And those three components which emerge during the interviews can then be the focus of the investigation from the police officers to make sure they uh, laser beam their energies and the resources into the areas where the witness or the suspect, in this case a suspect, is telling us um, something that's being contradicted by behaviour. So to wrap up, we've seen two components when we use fast scrub or go at high speed across the video, where he's talking about his belief that his wife didn't have an affair. And that seems to be credible because there are no inconsistencies. And he's illustrating to support his speech. And we see no leakage. Where in the second half, we see him clamp up uh, when he's talking about him having an affair. And that clamping up goes throughout his response. He's not angry or mad at the question or offended. He clamps up to try and uh, hold back his body language. But it leaks out. We see the single-sided hand shrug. We hear the volume drop as he distances himself from that claim. We've also got the body tension. He's holding back the illustrators now so he doesn't give anything away, not knowing that that itself is a giveaway. And to cap this off, we hear him say, I did not cheat on my wife. Now, you may remember Clinton, you know, uh, I did not have a sexual relations with that woman. Uh, when people avoid contractions, this occurs frequently when people are being deceptive. By contraction, I mean didn't, did not. So if I, I didn't do it, uh, I didn't have an affair, is what you will hear from truth tellers where research tells us that those who are lying will separate the words to try and convince us I did not have an affair, I did not cheat on my wife. And that's what we've got here.
So four indicators across this section from a, a clever uh, eased in question that he was probably unexpecting. So to sum up, there's serious doubts about um, when he left the home and whether he left Chinan behind. There's serious doubts about his intent when he went to work. And there's serious doubts about his claims that he's not having an affair. So those would be the focus of the ongoing investigation on a case like this. And it's exactly where the police go. Uh, so you'll see from YouTube videos, uh, there's also the use of polygraph. Um, and we've got thoughts about a polygraph, which we'll give you on, on later episodes. But they, they use some good and some not so good techniques, but they, they eventually got to the truth. And what you'll see is, and be thankful for, is um, uh, he was found guilty of killing his pregnant wife and his children. And he's got five life sentences, which are concurrent, so he will never be released from prison. So thanks for joining us. And if you like this, please, please give us a thumbs up. If you have any feedback, we want that too.